The story tells of people who wanted to build a tower up to heaven. Then they thought they had actually done it. But God's reaction is hilarious. Because the Bible states in Genesis 11 to 5, God came down to look at the city and the tower. You see, the tower went up to heaven and still God has to come down to see it. Isn't it funny? Indeed, God must have a sense of humor. Isn't it? And so we will study the tower or the story of Babel today. Not from the humorous perspective, but from a missional perspective. As a continuation of our series on the church. So if you have your Bibles with you, open them with me to Genesis chapter 11. I will be reading from the New King James Version, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. By the way, in some other version it says uh, Babel, because Babel and Shinar are synonymous. So they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now the question is, what displeases God for what the people of Shinar did? Is it making bricks? Is it building the city? Or is it building the tower that reaches to the heavens? What displeases God for what the people of Babel did? Let's study the first the background of the story to better understand what went wrong. Now, let's leave for a while Genesis 11 and go to Genesis verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. This time I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Genesis 1. 27 and 28, so God created men in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the feast of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so after the flood, so that's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So, men and women, humankind was created in the image of God, and they were told to what? To fill the earth and subdue it. Now, after the flood, God told Noah and his family the same message of his previous command to Adam and Eve. Let's read Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Apparently, God created 
and sent humankind forth to multiply and fill the earth in order that they might act as images of God, representing God's presence and upholding God's interest in the far flung corners of the world. And so we may conclude from Genesis 1 that God wanted humankind to fill the earth with God's own image in order that God might better exercise over all creation. And so it is God's purpose for the humankind to scatter to the earth, to carry out God's image. In other words, the command of God to scatter is the purpose of creation in the image of God. So if you will analyze carefully the text that I have just read, you can see there is a relationship between God creating humankind in, the, in his image and scattering and filling the earth. But interestingly, the people who built a city in the plain of Shinar or in Babel did not wish to do this. Why? Because they remained or they desired to remain altogether in one place. And so what the people of Shinar did was the opposite of what God intended them to do. Instead of scattering or going out to the whole earth to carry out the image of God and represent God in the far-flung corners of the world, the people of Shinar remained together in one place. They decided to build for themselves by cooperative endeavor a great city, a kind of central habitation and meeting place for all of them in which there was to be a high tower which could be seen from afar as a signpost of their point of assembly. And so if you will take a closer look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, it indicates that everything the people plan to do, both their building projects and making a name for themselves, was directed toward one end. And that is to avoid scattered over the face of all the earth. Let's read Genesis chapter 11, verse 4 again. This time, I will be reading from the New International Version. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. That's their goal. They don't want to be scattered. They want to be in just one place. That's what the people of Babel plan to do. They plan to avoid being scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And as you can see here in Genesis chapter 11, humankind tried to avoid carrying out the very mission for which they were created in the first place. And what is that? To fill the earth. To go out and fill the earth and represent God through his own image. So the scene of the people of Shinar does not lie in the desires to build a city which is a neutral, a moral act. So what the people of Shinar was trying to do was to avoid to be scattered or avoid to be scattered abroad. And to translate it to our modern terms, the people of Shinar did not want to go out to the whole world to preach the gospel of salvation. They did not want to represent the image of God to the far-flung places of the world. They want to build up instead of building out. 
What the people of Babel was trying to do was not that they arrogantly tried to be like God, to be like God, but that they have tried to avoid being God-like. You see, there's a danger of building up instead of building out. When we try to build ourselves our own comfortable and cozy little tower of Babel, where we are enjoying our own Adventist ghettos and subculture, there's a tendency to forget to go out and reach out to those people outside of our denomination. In other words, when we are so much occupied of building up our own image as a church and begin to acquire the mentality of institutional, institutionalism, we might forget our mission as a church. When we are more concerned of building up our own image instead of going out to preach the gospel, we are creating our own Tower of Babel. And God is not happy with it. You know, we human beings still tend to prefer, to prefer the familiar comforts of being around with people who are like us. People who speak our language, however language may be defined. And it's comfortable speaking in our own language to a language group we belong to, isn't it? But by doing that, we tend to make other language and language group out of place in our group. Other people who do not speak our own language felt they do not belong to our church. And they would feel that the church is a cliquish church. By grouping ourselves into cozy, homogenous communities, we are actually building various kinds of walls around ourselves in order to avoid being scattered abroad into unknown and familiar and therefore uncomfortable places. And God does not want us to cluster tightly together in comfortable groups where everyone thinks alike and talks alike, where all our collective energies are devoted to the avoidance of disturbing or scattering influences. Are we just satisfied of enjoying once another company? Speaking in our own language and not reaching out to others because, because it is more comfortable doing that. There's a danger for doing that and there is a term for that and that is inbreeding. In the academic world, inbreeding is not a good word. Inbreeding means that <laughs> Or academic inbreeding means you have a PhD candidate, so you have a doctoral candidate hired by the same university where they graduated and who remain there throughout their career. That's academic inbreeding. On the other hand, genetic inbreeding produces high frequency of sufferers from diseases. And inbreeding in the church may also happen. It can be called good old boy club. A church that tries to isolate themselves and all freshness is removed and avoided. They don't want to consider or they don't want any outsider to come in and take away their favorite spot on the pews. They're just happy and comfortable among themselves. Well, in the branch of the Habsburg family that inherited the Spanish throne, was loath to share power with outsiders. And so the Habsburg family hit upon the same solution that countless other monarchies did. If you don't want to share power, then keep it within the family. And so cousins married cousins, uncles married nieces, and second cousins married second cousins. 
And so from 50-50 onward, not a single outsider married into the Spanish royal line. And the result of all this was Charles II of Spain. Now we have a new Charles II in England, right? Because the Queen, Her Majesty, has just passed away. Oh, ja Charles III. Where well, they have the Charles II of Spain in 1550. And he is the result of this inbreeding. And quite possibly the most inbred person in history. Charles II of Spain. He, if you're going to look at him... He was tragically ugly, according to some writers. <laughs> inbreeding. Genetic inbreeding. And Charles' ancestry was so ridiculously intertwined. 95.3% of his genes could be traced back to just five ancestors. And so while the previous kings had escaped, their already consider considerable inbreeding relatively and skate, Charles suffered from massive mental, physical, and emo emotional disabilities, earning him the nickname El Echisado, the Hacks. And according to a writer, Alice Dare Wilkins, Charles' inability to father an heir sparked the war of the Spanish succession. Because of inbreeding, there was fighting after him. And this infighting in Spain was called the War of the Spanish Succession, in which half a million people fought over who should inherit his throne, which is a deadly outcome that might have been avoided had the Habsburg family did not become so completely reliant on inbreeding to preserve control of their power, which, of course, they ultimately lost it anyway. They thought that they're going to stay in power. And so they said, let's do inbreeding. But that caused their fall. No more Habsburg family in Spain. That's it. It ended their family. A local church may have similar fate if church members would do what we call inbreeding. Either it would lose its mission of reaching out to the community to preach the gospel to the world or to the church or to the whole community. If we will practice inbreeding in the church, the church would eventually die. Thus, the church must have its own window open to the outside world. It cannot be reduced to a safe, secure, familiar environment for those who already believe and belong. God's children must live and must not live, I'm sorry, they should not live in a spiritual ghetto, but the people of God should be scattered. They must venture out. Accepting the risk this involves. And refusing to be scattered so that we cannot bear our witness in the wider community can be identified as a Babylonian trait that should have no place among the citizens of the heavenly city. There is nothing wrong with building a city there's nothing wrong with building a church, building a tower, or building an edifice. What the Bible condemns is forgetting our mission by building them. What God does not like is not carrying out the mission for which they were built. 
in the first place. If our purpose of building an edifice is simply to worship comfortably or comfortably or enjoy the music and enjoy the air conditioned room and not wanting to go out to the world where sometimes there is uh, it's, it's very hot and there's heat wave especially in California right now we don't want to go out to the world we just comfortable sitting inside the church with air condition 75 degrees air condition if we do not want to go out to the world and to the community to preach the gospel. We are building our own Tower of Babel. We're not different from the builders of the Tower of Babel. What God wants is to build a city, to build a church, to build an edifice for the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. This is fulfilling God's mission of building for eternity. This is what we call building out, out to the community. God's purpose for us is to scatter around and go out to the world to preach his everlasting gospel and to preach Christ to all the world. And God does not intend for us to proclaim the good news only among those who speak our own language. Rather, the God we worship and whose good news we proclaim, wants us to fill the earth with the images of God in order to represent God's interests in every far-flung corner of the universe. Amen. Friends, it's interesting how the story of Babel ended. It ended in these words, as you can see in, in Genesis chapter 11, Verses 8 and 9. That's how the story of Babel ended. It reads, The Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. In this way, God, He scattered them all over the world. It appears then, that the Lord's scattering of the people of Shinar to the world is not a curse. It's not a curse at all, but a blessing and a calling. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, there's nothing more than fulfilling in life than to serve the Lord. The greatest joy in life is to see people accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior of their life. In Steps to Christ, page 80, Ellen White wrote, The spirit of unselfish labor for others gives death, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character, and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. The aspirations are elevated. There is no room for sloth or selfishness. Those who thus exercise the Christian graces will grow and will become strong to work for God. End of quote. So, would you like to experience that joy? Would you like to serve God unselfishly? And if that is your desire, would you like to indicate it by standing up from where you are seated? And I will pray a prayer of commitment today. Would you like to stand up as an indication of your commitment to serve the Lord as we sing our closing song on hymn number 578, So Send I You. Hymn number 578, So Send I You.